you are an avid viewer of this gaming channel, you will have known that I am occasionally a being of pure chaos, and part-time gaming trolling player. I have been a part of multiple single-player builds, multiplayer organizations, and massive modded playthroughs. And my experience in Minecraft is now long enough for me to recall various stories from all parts of the game in general. But it all begins with a rather quiet treehouse in a rather quiet forest. And it all went downhill from there. Something most people have done within the first few months of gaming is to create a new world simply to ignite hundreds of TNT just to see what will happen. The obvious result, is the destruction of the surrounding environment, for digital entertainment. That was until I found out that creatures human and hostile existed in this game. There were several things that I could do with this in creative mode, including creating a peaceful establishment that upholds human rights, or to create facilities dedicated to summoning villagers and zombies to see who would die last. The winner, would also die. But this design could be improved upon for greater entertainment. One of my favorite pastime in the good old days was finding villages with villagers and experimenting with them. Most of these experiments took place on my favorite seed, which was this, which had a nearby sizable village. In this world in particular, I isolated this village from all escape routes with a 1.5 meter tall fence, and added zombie spawners underground. The result was pure unadulterated zombie infection, which I recall watching because it was fascinating simulating a world where a disease spreads uncontrollably at the cost of society and economy and industry. But under the underground, was a hollow earth, which did not contain anything substantial, and was only there because I was testing something. But the world that suffered the worst of the disastrous consequences of the industrial revolution and the invention of fire, was New World 3. A massive wooden super flat world with lava lakes, and villages. Luckily this world had aged only a few minutes and went into cryostasis for 10 years, sparing all humanity. However, it was getting boring simply to witness the destruction of digital villagers by various means. It was time to come up with a new game. So far, all of my knowledge of Minecraft had been absorbed from the Minecraft's Wikipedia, as well as misinterpreted tutorials on the internet. Any information I learned outside of that was from accidental encounters in the actual game. This is because vanilla Minecraft has a very strange learning curve. The actual game gives very little information to the player. Forcing the player to learn from trial and error or from the internet. Back then, you never know when you'll find something new that is possible in the game. Which is why clickbait on Minecraft has been very successful. The Ether Portal is perhaps one of the most well-known examples of this. But I have faced countless disappointments of following crafting recipes from modded Minecraft without knowing that I had to obtain the mod in the first place. One of the only times that watching clickbait was productive was when I saw that you could spawn the Wither. The Witch was also another accidental discovery. It was basically the villager but alcoholic and misanthropic. One day, as I was spamming witch spawn eggs, I somehow made the discovery that hostile mobs would target each other if accidentally provoked. Combine this with the witch's splash potion attack, and you have this. This was one of my favorite pastimes. Seeing entities destroying other entities in contests to see who would come out victorious. But in this case, the witch's pain was eternal due to their regenerative strength. So what I got was an infinite Belisov Zabotinsky chemical reaction of pain. Sometime later, I discovered anvils and their reaction to the laws of gravity. I also discovered that having heavy objects fall on your head usually results in pain. So I used this to create another game. The way it works is like this. Villagers are spawned in a box, with several layers of anvils above them, kept in check by several floors of wood. This would be set on fire, which led to the anvils breaching containment and falling down onto the unfortunate souls below. But this would also create a floor of anvils that the villagers could use to escape the rather short wooden box. And I guess that the escaped villagers could be called victorious. So far I had experimented with villages, witches, zombies, and other beings of higher sentience. But the one mob that was safe from my experimentation, were sheep. The presence of sheep was more bearable, and thus I tended to try to create comfortable environments for them, which did not include death or destruction. 
the Sheep Village world was born, containing several Diodovus Aries, and some named Jeb underscore, which was a trick I learned from stumbling upon the Minecraft's Wikipedia page for sheep. So rather than destroying and killing stuff, I decided to try creating stuff. After a while of moving around in Minecraft, I guess I discovered parkour on accident, when I realized that blocks that were spaced out a certain distance would create a fun challenge to try to navigate. The result, was this village parkour map, which also showed signs of basic intelligence when it came to redstone mechanics. It may seem that one way or another, my knowledge of Minecraft was mysteriously growing. But some of the worlds were utter nonsense. This included New World 2, which I will simply show. This other world, known as Commands, was even more bizarre. The sleeping quarters were surrounded by Cucurbita Maxima. Adjacent to it was a snow-laden weird arrow, a mass skeleton grave, and even more pumpkin. I had no idea what this could possibly mean. But perhaps that will change on June the 2nd, 2035, 3.15 PM PST. One of the strangest features of these new worlds, was this weird gray stick man, who kept appearing in my worlds, along with pumpkins for some reason. Further down the line, the structures I created were beginning to show signs of intelligence, sometimes imbued with insanity. This world was literally called Insanity, which was riddled with wooden swimming pools, wooden diving boards, wooden houses, and scattered doors. Eventually, I had known enough about Minecraft to put together an automatic resource gathering farm, featuring hoppers, pistons, and redstone. Far before I had learned about Greg Tech as I have today, my thirst for automation and the urge to begin the industrial revolution wherever I went was strong. But I only got as far as automatically harvesting melons and pumpkins. There was also the so-called advanced farm, which features a design I copied off of YouTube, whose main purpose was to sort creepers from zombies and skeletons, using various traps and entities. The creepers were then stored in this box for further analysis. Besides building stuff simply for practical purposes, I created builds with the purpose of making something massive and impressive and magnificent and spectacular. Which is why I made this extremely unfinished cruise ship. What it lacks in scale however, is made up for in unnecessary details that nobody would find. In this random chest is this random book known as, Ship Magazine. This contains several masterpieces such as the retelling of the Titanic in lazy English, several abhorrent jokes with a humor content of 0.1 micro funny, and a ship copyright. Besides that, the ship was made out of materials that would have made the ship sink anyways. The bathrooms were made out of golden blocks, which were the 8th heaviest element in the periodic table. There was also an aquarium with a do not break sign for fools, as well as the remains of a dead squid for some reason. There were also builds that were made to try to tell a story. This was attempted in the village of secrets. Which was more like the village of secret, because there was only one secret area hidden by a redstone door, which contained zero secrets. Finally, there were worlds containing attempts to invent a new genius design that would revolutionize gaming itself. In this world that I will not pronounce, I created a base with a defense system capable of shooting arrows in approximately 50% of a 360 degree arc surrounding the house. The main pattern in most of the early worlds was that they were underwhelmingly unfinished, having at most two or three features before I moved on to the next idea. Luckily I didn't have a habit of deleting worlds, so I am now able to access the Ultra Kingdom, which only has one chicken coop. The Super Mall, which only had an entrance and a few stores. The Floating Island Adventure, which only had two floating land masses, predicting high pixel sky block five years before it began. The Ultra Playground, which only had one slide which, when jumped from, would cause painful injury upon contact with the ocean 200 meters below. And then there was the Banner Village. Upon logging in, I instantly became British. At this point it was about 2015. And I wanted to make something big after seeing YouTubers play these massive adventure maps with a solid story. So I wanted to make my own. Unfortunately, 
The YouTube video that inspired this world has long been forgotten, but all I know is that it contains levels with different themes, such as an iron level, golden level, coal level, and lapis level. It also has quote unquote, hidden diamonds, and impossible parkour. And there were several rules that I was going to simply ignore. It starts off with a golden maze, which I skipped entirely. A coal maze that was supposed to be beaten without Phil Bright. An iron maze that had impossible parkour, impossible lava, and impossible hidden diamonds. All signs that I had been inspired by Minecraft clickbait on YouTube. I soon reached the slime level, lapis level, and redstone level, and several other uninspired levels that were basically parkour combined with something deadly which abruptly ended at this extremely impossible puzzle. Next up was a mystery map rather than pure parkour and impossible challenges. It all begins on this half-sunken ship, with an owner that wants to leave the ship, and then leaves the ship by a rather unpleasant way. An extremely hidden book stored in this extremely hidden room reveals that something is hidden somewhere in some mountains somewhere. Upon adventuring out there are various structures giving items that are slightly helpful, as well as a house that leads into the basement of the house that leads into the ravine below the basement of the house. Navigating all the poorly placed lava and cracks in the walls, eventually leads, to nothing. Like and subscribe. But what if, I combined adventure maps and mystery maps, with horror? The result was the lab. In the old days I believe this was worthy of several Oscar nominations and Pulitzer Prizes. But it was pure cringe. The player starts off in a broken cell in an underground lab, with signs of something catastrophic happening. There is nothing to be discovered, and no clues are given on anything. The written books found were cheap attempts at giving a creepy atmosphere. And pressure plates were used to try to jump scare the player with chat messages containing messages such as, Welcome to CR Sector 3. There is hashtag no going back now. We are hashtag not finished yet exclamation mark. And welcome to the hashtag absolute. The map is extremely short. After just a few mazes, the ending scene is reached. The ending is an absolute masterpiece containing deep messages on the socio-economic geopolitical state of the world such as, Infinity. Error Overload Infinity. Errorag Fifi. I. Am. Watching. Smiley Face Emoji. Infinite. Good luck sleeping. Like and subscribe for more insane challenges. Sometimes however, maps did not have to be fancy delicacies with intricate complicated intersecting storylines. Sometimes I wanted something simple to have hours of fun on. This was Ultra Arena. A challenge where I had diamond armor, no weapons, and had to survive in a diamond walled compound with villagers and iron golems against a hostile outside with zombies, creepers, and skeletons coming from spawners and invading the inner compound constantly. This could theoretically have infinite rounds of intense fighting to witness and take part in, with a few breaks here and there to spawn in more iron golems. These small-scale projects were getting boring, however. This time, like all the other times before, I was going to make something huge. The final single-player worlds I shall show were the longest-lasting projects I had. It was in this world that I discovered the clone command which I abused to create a rather large city with neighborhoods, stores, hotels, and schools. None of these structures had any substantial detail, and the building style was extremely languorous and lackadaisical. Every structure was a block with a triangle roof. And against all odds, the gray stick man was back. Now for my second favorite world in my save files. Ultra Mansion. A floating unfinished mansion, in the same jungle that my first world was in. Most of my time was spent in this mansion pretending to be a billionaire capitalist materialist hedonist another adjective ending in -ist. Unfortunately there is a giant chunk deleted out of the center of the mansion, but it probably did not contain anything important. The world is rather corrupted as well, leading to the mysterious vanishing of all signs and entities. But it probably did not contain anything important. There was an infinite cake room, secret rooms to store billionaire wealth stashes, a TV, a mini game room, a dining room that used to have infinite food dispensers, a random tree house sticking out of the kitchen, and other luxuries that helped me pretend to be a rich billionaire capitalist materialist hedonist. And last but not least, the ultimate arena. 
my favorite Minecraft world, with the most development, and 80 hours spent on it. The idea behind this world was that it would be a massive arena serving as an action set for an epic battle between me, iron golems, villagers, and hostile mobs. The first structure I made was this apartment building with villager spawners, which would be under attack by zombies from the outside. This was eventually expanded upon to create an entire poorly designed city with everything imaginable stuffed within a 1000 by 1000 area. So it was time to re-explore this world. At the edge of the world is yet another unoriginal cube, which is referred to as Cadmill University. Upon further inspection it appears to have several useless classes, with rather useless lessons inside. Nearby was a perfectly square ocean with various sea transport vehicles on it, including a cruise ship and a Pirates of the Caribbean reference. There were also various symbols of capitalism in society including an office building skyscraper, several industrial plants, a mine exploiting basically zero natural resources, and a mall with several neat details inside, including a movie theater and some sort of playground. Above all this was an airplane standing perfectly still, with several bizarre airplane controls. Below, was a subway system intersecting with a manually created abandoned mine shaft flooded with lava. In the more rural parts of the city, there were several cave systems and abandoned tunnels that were the source of the hostile mobs, as well as an emergency bunker. In the distance was a massive farm that was feeding absolutely no one. Beyond the usual human civilization stuff, there were several random structures that did not exactly fit the theme of an epic battle arena. But towards the end, I focused more on building stuff for the sake of building, rather than actually using it as a battleground. In the center of the city was a so-called glitched section, which led to a recreation of human food with colored wool. And I recall that I put TNT inside the food for some reason. The final section to explore, was yet another arena that was disconnected from the rest of the Ultimate Arena Cinematic Multiverse. This took the form of a massive floating cathedral that took approximately 50 seconds to escape due to bad level design. But was actually inescapable because it was unfinished anyways. With that, the Ultimate Arena world was explored. And I had revisited every single player world I had created. But of course, single player wasn't the only way to play this game. Up until 2016, every time I clicked the multiplayer button, all I saw was the scanning for games on your local network text, so I assumed that the multiplayer feature was broken and not worth bothering with. That was until I learned that the multiplayer feature was not broken, and therefore, worth bothering with. At that time, the Mineplex and the Hive were the two servers I had heard the most about. Hypixel would only rise to prominence and enter my awareness a few years later. Meanwhile on the Hive, I was attempting to keep in mind what I knew about how to behave on the internet. Do not engage with any unscrupulous individuals. Do not divulge any personal information. And report all cyberbullying. With that in mind, I proceeded to explore the Hive server, which has long since been closed due to abysmally low player count. All I remember from this Hive experience, was that there was Build Battle, Sky Wars, and Sky Giants. Almost nobody knows about the mysterious Sky Giants game, with very little footage of it existing on YouTube. But for some reason Sky Giants became my favorite game on the server. And I still recall details from that game. It was basically Sky Wars except that mining ores would cause the industrial revolution, wealth inequality, and health side effects to occur all at once. Using coins from mining ores. Various accoutrements and equipment could be bought from the island hardware store, including building materials, which were supposed to be used to defend a giant at base. The goal, was to penetrate whatever defenses were on other islands, and destroy all other giants. On top of all this, everyone had infinite lives and keep inventory on. This may seem like an incredible strange game. Because it was. Which is why I preferred it rather than more normal games such as Sky Wars and Build Battle. And along the way I had met a singular person who actually talked in game. His name is forgotten to me, but it had the word watermelon. Due to me not knowing how to add friends in the server, I had no reliable way to contact the watermelon guy. 
so the only way to play with him was to get lucky and see him in a random Sky Giants lobby once in a while. Which would happen randomly every two months on average. So every two months, I would get the chance to play Sky Giants with Watermelon Guy. And this only happened four times. The fourth and final encounter with the Watermelon Guy was sometime in May of 2016. The only thing I remember from our last encounter was that he said, Long time no see. And we proceeded to play our final Sky Giants game together, probably destroying every other team in the process. Which would be followed, by an infinitely long time, of no see. The Hive and Minecraft multiplayer had simply faded from my interests. Until 2019, I was in this location known as Real Life, in a location known as a public education facility. It was on this fateful year that I met two classmates going by the internet monikers of Derp Man MLG and Murda Blurp. And towards the end of the designated school year for this education facility, everyone else in my classroom was playing Minecraft Factions. The overall idea behind Minecraft Factions is that players would organize themselves into long-term teams, competing to become the best on the server over a few months. This would be accomplished either by pure grinding or by raiding other teams, but mostly, by pay to win. And this was somehow appealing to school attendees who were unbearably bored. Much like Cookie Clicker and Pokemon Go Showdown, this Minecraft Factions thing would spread like a disease throughout the entire school system, with friends getting their friends who got their friends with their own friends into Minecraft Factions. So by pure peer pressure, Derp Man MLG and Murda Blurp would begin to spend absurd amounts of free time climbing the ranks of brutal faction servers such as, I forgot the name. After some unspecified disaster on a previous faction's server, Derpman MLG and Murdy Blurp decided to start over on Cosmic PvP, one of the most famous faction servers at that time, which is also unfortunately shut down as of today. Anyways, for Cosmic PvP, Derpman MLG had the idea of adding me to his new faction for a 50% increase in manpower. And I accept it. Little did I know I would be joining a measly three-man team with the name, Sister Squad. And we were up against several extremely powerful factions who had started weeks before us. Things weren't looking so good. But the Sis Squad shall persevere. Not a lot of screenshots have survived to this day, but from what it looks like, it appears that the Sis Squad had created a base in the middle of an ocean, which consists of several cobblestone barriers formed by lava casts and an inner obsidian layer containing all of the valuables of the base, including mob spawners. These were found using a genius strategy I came up on my own. In the F3 section, there is an entity counter showing the amount of entities in my line of sight. Since mob spawners tended to spawn mobs, and since mobs tended to be entities, and since F3 tended to show which direction the entities were, I used this to basically x-ray for spawners deep underground. I thought I was the smartest dream high IQ player on Cosmic PvP. But I forgot one crucial piece of information. I was not actually the smartest dream high IQ player on the server. The base got raided approximately two times. Since no video evidence of this exists, it shall be recreated in MS Paint. In the first raid, what I think happened was that someone built a cannon outside of the base and started blowing stuff up somewhere in the base, which led to the base being cracked open. And then everyone died. But we did not lose anything of value because it was all in the personal vault anyways. The second raid was basically an exact repeat of the first raid, except the perpetrators were different people. On the third time, the Sis squad decided that we were not going to learn anything from our mistakes. And we did the exact same base design, except several thousands of blocks away from spawn. Besides that, me and Derpman MLG decided on a new way to obtain riches on the server. Mining. This was an overpowered strategy due to how overpowered pickaxes could get, with auto smelt and 7x7 mining ranges. The minerals obtained could be sold to the in-game shop for easy profit. 
But there was only one problem with this strategy. It was tedious. And addicting. We were mining non-stop for the funny digital currency. This grind would persist until 2 a.m. on some days, and spill over into class time. Me and Derpman MLG would maximize the grind as much as possible by hiding in certain gaming spots we found in the classroom, and maintaining optimal gaming position. After making a few million dollars, we decide to blow it on smart things such as creative flight at base, and stupid things such as an iron golem spawner, which we accidentally lost anyways because we put it in a territory that we forgot to claim. And then Derp Man MLG gambled millions more coins on coin flips. The result, is that we got bored of cosmic PvP and quit Minecraft. Or did we? Because me and Murda Blurp decided to continue gaming on different servers. On Murda Blurp's personal free Eternos server, he decided to play this Minecraft map known as Diversity 3. A massive map where the player must collect approximately 16 pieces of wool from challenges ranging from parkour, survival, mystery, puzzles, and probably some other stuff. This was a trial meant to test the IQ of everyone involved and was meant to be taken seriously. But of course, that did not happen. I don't think it works. We ended up using Diversity 3 as a PvP map because the challenges were too hard to seriously play. The only thing we were able to beat was the parkour section, because we were at least smart enough to jump from places to other places. And we managed to do a bit of the puzzle section from sheer brute force. Progress was rather slow. But me and Murdy Blurp decided that we would finish Diversity 3 once and for all tomorrow. But we never did that. It was quite clear that we were not going to beat Diversity 3 in a reasonable amount of time, so Murdy Blurp decided that it was time to check out the infamous server, known as Hypixel. It was still 2019, and it was at around this time that Hypixel triumphed over Mindplex and the Hive in terms of popularity. And on Hypixel, me and Squad, decided to play Bed Wars. The other 7.9 billion humans on this planet would not be ready for the gaming that was about to occur. Sometime in mid-August, the genius Hypixel developers added something to the item shop that allows you to spawn a miniature tower wherever you pleased. But this could bypass the build height limit in Bed Wars, allowing the creation of ridiculous fortresses to bamboozle the enemy. But that was the only purpose of this strategy. Trolling. Winning did not actually occur, but we managed to waste about half an hour of the enemy's time. Me, Derp Man MLG, and acquaintances of Derp Man MLG, known as Art Peace and Dragon Master, had created a 255 block high tower, which was being firebombed by the unwavering yellow team. We were stranded and cut off from our resources far below. And in the midst of all the explosions, we thought it would be a good idea to stand on the edge to watch for fireballs that were going to kill us by blowing us off the edge. Ah, ah, there's one coming, watch out guys! Did you guys see that fireball just fly by? <laughs> oh, there's no! Oh, no! 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 Oh my god! How'd that even happen? I didn't click Q. Can I put- Ah! <laughs> I opened, I walked forward and opened my inventory. <laughs> After the unfortunate deaths of half the team, me and Art Peace decided to descend down the monstrous tower creation to fight the seemingly unstoppable yellow team, and we see the damage done to our beautiful tower. The yellow team had attempted to replicate our military secrets, by placing down chests everywhere which didn't actually do anything. So they were stuck on the ground. So me and Dark Peace arrived at the bottom for a last stand against yellow team. Ah! Oh, he's right there! Go kill him, him on the fence gun, come on, come on. Come on. Jumped him and him off. No, he's taking fall damage. Guys, jump him and kill him, jump him and knock him off. Jump him! Go, go, go! Get him. Yes! Got him. Wait, is that a is that a chest? Right. Look at the bottom. Get an Enderpearl. You got an Enderpearl. Hey, chill out, chill out. Got an Enderpearl. Watch out, watch out. Don't knock him off. Knock him off. Hey, I can't see you. Hey. Uh, 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 uh. Just go for it, dude. Just go for it. Uh, 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 uh. What do I do? What? Go for it. Just jump down and kill him. Okay. One v three. He's not gonna kill him. Run! He's right behind you. No. 
No. No. <laughs> I, just, I just need the doubt. <laughs> After doing a short grieving session, we decided to do the exact same thing in our next game. After buying approximately 1 quintillion towers, we reached the height limit once again. This time, the yellow team was slightly more competent and decided to actually climb the towers using some ladders. We spotted this suspicious activity and decided to shoot down the invaders. So we bow spammed down the elevator. And the enemy, responded with this. It was a punch bowl. And I nearly faced the same demise as Derp Man MLG. But for some reason, we all decided to go towards the elevator. They're shooting up! Get out of there! What's wrong with you? Ah! <laughs> 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 you <laughs> <dumb>. <laughs> break the ladder! Break the ladder! Break the ladder! Break the ladders, guys! The new plan, was to slow down the ascent of the enemy, by breaking all the 5 million ladders that were everywhere. But it was too late. Here! Does not get up with her Ah! He got up the other way! I forgot about the Jump off! Just kidding, I'm just kidding. Ah! Get him! <laughs> nice water God, bucket. Bro. How did they get up? Did they just bridge? I was like. And that was the end of the two greatest plays in Bed Wars history. But Hypixel, had a lot more to offer. So Hypixel recently released their own unique take on the skyblock genre. So basically you spawn on your own island, you cut down a tree, you bridge over to the other island, and then you log into Windcraft. Sometime in the summer, Technoblade begins gaming on Hypixel Skyblock, starting a chain reaction that eventually got me into Hypixel Skyblock. Murdy Blurp was a big fan of Technoblade, so when he saw the existence of Skyblock, he decided to bring me, Derp Man MLG, and his friends into a new Skyblock co-op. The goal, was to avoid being extremely bored due to it being summer break. At the time, the most sensible way to get rich was by exploiting the natural resources of the deep caverns. Grinding there was simple. You mine stuff. You sell the stuff. You buy stuff. You mine new stuff with that stuff. The cycle was to obtain common ores on surface floors, get better equipment, use the better equipment to survive the deeper floors, and eventually reach the final obsidian cavern floor, which was misleading because it was very rich in diamonds. So the whole squad would simply mine diamonds all day long, for one of the greatest armor sets at that time. Hardened diamond. But after hardened diamond, there was not much to do. Or was it not his hat? Murdy Blur patched a plan. It involved creating a new co-op with me, but with some new try-hard friends to seriously play Skyblock. And so, Mudareth and LV60 were acquainted. So we did everything we did on the old co-op, but on the new co-op. After obtaining some hardened diamond accoutrements, we followed the advice of Murdy Blurp, who told us to follow the advice of the mysterious YouTuber known as Time Deo, and collected all the objects known as Fairy Souls for an extra stat boost. Once we had extra health and stats from finding all aforementioned Fairy Souls, we headed off, to the nether section of High Pixel Skyblock. Murdy Blurp had continued to watch Technoblade's informational videos on Skyblock, and Murdy Blurp decided to copy Technoblade's Magma Boss strategy. Every two hours on this charred wasteland useless nether island, a giant magma cube would spawn, which would bequeath the rather valuable ember rod upon death. However, we weren't the only ones who sought the infamous ember rod. Tens of other players who had also probably watched Technoblade would camp the Nether Island for hours on end for a chance at killing the Magma Cube boss. And after several painstaking days of gaming, the entire co-op, except for me, would obtain one singular Ember Rod for personal use. Except for Murdy Blurp, who accidentally used his Ember Rod as furnace fuel. But he obtained a new one, so it all balances out. Any spare ember rods that we farmed would be put on the auction house for consumer consumption and personal profit. Leading to us accumulating millions of coins from the privatization of personal wealth. 
But just when we thought we were at the top of the world, the Hypixel developers introduced the Pigman Sword, made not of metals or money, but 1.2 million pork chops compressed into enchanted cooked pork chops compressed into a Pigman Sword. Nobody thought this was worth it, except LV60, the grindiest grinder, who was ambitious enough to unironically attempt the obtaination of the Pigman Sword. Now how exactly would 1.2 million pork chops be obtained? The method for Pigman Sword was apparently not to kill pigs manually, but to kill pigs automatically and spawn pigs automatically using pig minions. The setup was to spawn pigs using minions at the top of a giant tower leading to certain death, with a hopper system to collect thousands of pork for personal consumption. The only downside, was that in order for the pigs to spawn, someone had to AFK on the personal island 24-7. So he AFK 24-7. In return, we got, absolutely nothing. In the meantime, we pursued other activities, like fishing while watching Minecraft Monday from Technoblade's perspective. While this may seem peaceful, the more things you fish, the more fishing experience you get, making it possible for dangerous sea creatures to find you. The final creature unlocked was the Sea Emperor, which drops the Emperor Skull, 24 of which are needed for the divers accoutrements, which only existed as a flex. And so, LV60 decided to obtain it. After days of hours of constantly fishing and accumulating loot from the sea creatures, he did it. No screenshot exists of him using the diver suit, but he did it. With his fishing swag and his pigman sword, LV60 got the attention of one of the most advanced Hypixel Skyblock guilds at that time. Skyborn. Which he got into with relative ease. And in this aforementioned Skyborn guild, was a member known as Not an Ego, another top Skyblock gamer. And LV60 received a secret money making strategy from Not an Ego, to make money automatically. This strategy was so secret that guest visits to our Skyblock profile were temporarily disabled to prevent a leak of the method. The secret strategy was to make a tower of dark regions where only Endermen can spawn, which was ensured using a biome changer wand to create a localized end dimension biome. At the top of a tower is a water source block that occasionally sends water down onto all floors of the tower, washing the spawned Endermen into a swimming pool of death where they die and drop pearls into a hopper collection system. The water flown is timed by a cobblestone minion, which occasionally breaks a cobblestone block to release the water, which is regenerated with a cobblestone generator. The created pearls are then used to mass-produce aspects of the end swords to sell on the auction house to unsuspecting consumers. The daily profit from this, amounted to 1 million coins. Every day. Simply from doing nothing. This added up to several tens of millions of digital currency piling up in the bank. Which would be useful, very soon. The Hypixel developers released what would become one of the most important updates to the game. A new end dimension line mass, with new equipment to obtain and dragons to fight. The diver suit and pig man sword now had competition, from dragon equipment and the aspect of the dragon's sword. Without any delay, LV60, me, and Murda Blurp decided to dabble in the end update. Using some of the saved money, I obtained Ender Accoutrements and a Leaping Sword to survive the extremely hostile environment of the end, and destroy the dominant Enderman species there, for a chance of getting the Summoning Eye. With 8 Summoning Eyes, a Dragon Boss could be summoned, which is the primary source of all the juicy dragon loot in existence. Little did the Hypixel developers know, that they had just invented gambling. Because the dragons came in 7 types, with strong, unstable, and superior dragons giving the greatest equipment. Anything else was total garbage. Luckily, all types had a chance of manufacturing the aspect of the dragon. But it was only a chance. Dragon rewards were also based on who did the most damage to the dragon, so this made each dragon fight an extremely stressful clown show where everyone in the lobby swarmed the dragon, using various autistic strategies ranging from shooting it, teleporting to it and hitting it, snowballing it, hacking, and using magic hoogly dooglies. However, we do not care. So me, Murda Blurp, and LV60 began the process of farming dragon equipment. Luckily, it was possible to avoid people who could possibly deal more damage than us. 
So before each dragon fight we did, we would lobby hop and check for any pros who might do more damage than us, and watch for the infamous warpers. The warpers were a species of men who would warp their friends whenever they saw a dragon fight, using the high pixel party feature. But even if we managed to dodge pros and warpers, it was still a nail biter to see who would get the most damage and hence highest chances of accumulating wealth. Nobody was sure if we were going to get anything out of the dragon fights. So there was only one way to find out. This, was the peak of gaming. We even obtained a spare aspect of the dragons, which we sold for even more digital currency. LV60's spare pigman sword was handed down to Murdy Blurp, and I used the profits from everything we did so far, to acquire the superior dragon equipment. The best armor in the game at that time. We had done all that had to be done in the new update. And things were looking good for the Murdy Blurp co-op. But then, LV60 and Murdy Blurp would return to the public institution known as public education, resulting in less gaming being performed. That was true, until it became false. During the event known as Winter Break, Murdy Blurp materialized out of the public institution known as public education to check out Skyblock for the first time in eternity. And he had a new plan. Since LV60 didn't play anymore, Murdy Blurp, me, and Murdereth kicked him from the co-op, and Murdereth left as part of the plan, leaving behind a bunch a bunch of items to collect. But at around the same time, I made a fatal mistake of showing emotion during an event known as a petty argument over something stupid, during which I told Murda Blurp to leave the co-op. And then, Murdy Blurp actually left the co-op. After this whole ordeal, I decided to find a new community. So I decided to follow in LV60's footsteps. At this point, I was able to make it past Skyborn's rather difficult entry requirements. Even though LV60 was gone, I talked with the other members of the Skyborn Guild, which served an introduction to the larger Skyblock community. From there, I learned that at that time, first place frags was the most affluent and well-known group of players, who had accumulated Brobding Nagian riches from dragon fighting. There was a substantial amount of drama between Skyborn and first place frags, due to suspicions that first place frag members were cheating to obtain higher Skyblock skill levels. And at the time, Skyborn had dedicated skill grinders such as Squeezelord and Huckast, who were well respected for their grind. But one fateful day, Not Not Melon decided to join Skyborn. He was the founder of the infamous Talisman Optimizer tool, which had gained attention throughout the community due to its ability to optimize talismans. But Not Not Melon was bored. So he decided to challenge me to a race, to see who would get a skill average of 31st. In the old days, Skyblock only had seven different skills, known as farming, fishing, mining, foraging, enchanting, alchemy, and combat. Each of these would give their own stat boosts upon leveling up. But each needed immense amounts of grinding. Except, for alchemy. The best way to level alchemy was to buy enchanted sugar cane from the auction house and brew it into potions, which would take just a few hours. But I thought I had a genius idea. I would farm all of the sugar cane manually so I could level up farming as well. This was a major mistake that wasted about 100 valuable man hours. And of course, not not Melon won, because he used the genius strategy of buying brewing materials. But despite this major failure, I decided to get skill average 30 just to finish the job anyways, with a bit of help from leveling farming using an ancient degraded pumpkin farm built by LV60 in the old days. It may seem that I had beaten Hypixel Skyblock and seen all that it had to offer. But there was one problem. I had a Skyblock addiction from all of this mind-numbing grinding. And I was going to come up with fake meaningless goals to accomplish. Such as getting more Skyblock coins. Since I was bored of the Enderman farm method and Dragon farm method and all other methods. 
I decided to browse through the worst place in the multiverse for ideas. The Hypixel forums. But one fateful day, I stumbled upon this post. The ultimate trading guide, created by infamous Mutefi. A near multi-billionaire on Skyblock, who whispered into our ears the strategy to reach his wealth. Auction flipping. Which was basically going to the auction house, buying items for low prices during quiet hours, and reselling them for high prices during peak Skyblock hours. It was easy money. So I fell for it. But then, it actually worked. Nothing catastrophic happened. So I did what every grinder must do when they do something that works. They do it even more. The main item of interest that I dealt with was the aspect of the dragons, which I would stockpile tens of during low hours and resell when the auction house became more active. But of course, I was not the only one who was interested in auction flipping. Even though Mutefi was long gone when he revealed all of his money-making strategies, two players, known as Kalsan and Kevsh, were competing with me for auction house supremacy. Which sometimes led to us trying to snipe auctions from each other. Which is where alt accounts come into play. By transferring some spare money to an alt account, I could use the alt account to snipe my own auctions back from snipers, to ensure that I would not get lowballed by strangers on the internet. I had become a complete tryhard over Skyblock coins. But after several tens of days of rinsing and repeating, I was getting bored. Due to these reasons, I decided, that after accumulating a few hundreds of millions of coins, perhaps it was time to put my Skyblock journey to an end. But then, something would happen, that would change everything. Approximately the same time, a controversy would shatter Skyborne into pieces. As it turns out, unbeknownst to everyone, HU Cast had fallen to the dark side of cheating after being tempted by the thought of exploiting for higher skill levels. And he was caught in 4K, causing him to admit to cheating and losing interest in the game. This, along with some other smaller arguments that all built up to this day, caused Skyborne to split, with a mass exodus of former Skyborne members fleeing to join Trouble Brewing, which was a rapidly growing guild that originated as a group of former first place Frags members who were not so pleased with the original guild. And while all this chaos was happening, Not Not Melon decided to return to do a little trolling. At this point, Melon had basically quit the game after acquiring several riches and finishing the main work on the Talisman Optimizer. So he decided to go out with a blast. Literally. He griefed his own personal island, before doing a massive free giveaway to several Skyborne members. Casually handing tens of millions of coins worth of free items to a person known as the Banana Cow. He decided to give a few personal items to me, but since I was offline at the time of the trolling, Melon passed it on to a Skyborne officer, with instructions to pass it to me when I logged in. But the officer decided to use the items to bribe me to stay in Skyborne, rather than leaving for the rapidly growing trouble brewing. I forgot what happened after this. But I somehow got Melon's items back, which were stored in a personal graveyard I made for him, on my personal island. And I joined Trouble Brewing anyways, since my friends had joined it. Basically, the COVID quarantine incident and the Skyborne HU cast incident had thrown my gaming experience into a state of utter chaos. But with all this newfound free time, and the lack of other things I could do, I decided that I was no longer going to quit Skyblock, and to explore this new Trouble Brewing community that I had gotten myself into. Trouble Brewing was far more active than Skyborne, with approximately three times more the members. And the members themselves were rather unusual. The Guild Master was live broadcast, who would accidentally get himself banned sometime in May, which was commemorated by me with this extremely sad but life-changing memorial. The rest of the Trouble Brewing members seem to have a fascination with the song Candy Land by Tobu, released on no copyright sounds. 
and they all were obsessed with getting a higher skill average, which was the average of all the 7 skill levels the players had. The maximum skill average possible was 50, which would take about a thousand hours to obtain. Only a madman would pursue such a thing. But in a community with tens of thousands of online players during quarantine, it was certain that there would be a few madmen. Such as Thoughts and Lin Man. These two raced to max all skills, which culminated with Lin Man winning sometime in July. Several other trouble brewing members would eventually follow in Lin Man's footsteps, with Pablo being the next closest player to skill supremacy. Which was celebrated with a rap song I made for him. All of the skill grinding had a side effect of causing trouble brewing to surpass Skyborne in overall skill average, which was celebrated by playing Candyland. But these joke videos were not the only things I made during quarantine. I had been using stock images from Google search and Microsoft default video editor to put together masterpieces such as, the best way to obtain combat 50, the race to obtain maximum skills, and how to obtain mining 50 without mining. And this somehow got me to my first thousand subscribers, which was celebrated with the following PowerPoint. pattern. I have made skill grinding and sky block my life for now. I breathed, ate, created, and consumed skills. But why were people so obsessed with minor stat boosts from getting skill levels? Ever since the end update, which was a year ago by now, the Hypixel developers began teasing the release of the so-called Dungeons update. If released, it would be the most life-changing, game-changing, reality-changing, biggest update made to Skyblock. And it would supposedly only be able to be played only by the fittest of players with best equipment and stats. And higher stats, needed higher skill levels. But how exactly would these skill levels be obtained? There had to be a strategy to minimize suffering and maximize gaming. So I used vigorous intelligence, massive amounts of testing, calculated the amount of time it would take to calculate the optimal round to get skills, and conversed with the rest of the community, to come up with my 7 part plan to max out all skills in Skyblock. And along the way, since I had a lot of spare time left even with gaming, I decided to document my quest for 50 skill average for my 1000 loyal followers. And yes, I said 50 skill average because I had decided to obtain it as a crowning achievement of my Skyblock profile, whether or not the skills would actually help me in dungeons. Anyways here was the strategy. I had already obtained Alchemy 50 from farming and brewing massive amounts of sugarcane. Which also brought me to farming level 30. Farming level 50 was simple as well. All I had to do was farm pumpkins on my personal island, using a 4 layer 100 by 100 pumpkin farm to obtain 400,000 farming experience per hour. For comparison, going from level 1 to 50 needed 50 million experience in total. Luckily, farming pumpkins for 100 hours straight was made more bearable by watching random 1 hour video essays on useless topics. And watching people talk about their opinions for hours on end. Before I knew it, farming 50 was in my hands. Now for foraging 50, which would be more unbearable. The first part of the foraging plan was to obtain a tree capitator. The second part was the hardest. Traveling to a public forest island to farm trees for about a hundred hours. This was hard, because I had to deal with other people. Competition for foraging experience was so high because foraging provided video game strength, which leads to more damage being dealt, which leads to dungeons being easier. So according to this, everyone tried foraging. This was back when private island foraging had not yet been invented by something like this, so I had to come up with my own strategy to deal with public foraging forests. The first strategy, was to trick people into leaving my lobby, which had a 50% success rate. The second strategy, was to simply outcompete everyone else to make them rage quit the lobby, which had a 33% success rate. The final strategy, was to drink invisibility potions and pretend to be a ghost haunting the lobby. Which didn't work. 
But the pain was finally over, after a few weeks. Now for enchanting 50. I sold all of the wood I collected and used the coins to buy several bajillion tons of lapis lazuli, which I crafted into grand experience bottles. Each one gives approximately 30 levels, which can be used to enchant a mid-tier enchanting book. This had a byproduct of getting enchanting skill experience. Now all I had to do was repeat this a few thousand times. About 10 hours and 3000 enchanting books later, the utterly useless enchanting 50 was obtained. Now for something that was actually useful. Combat 50. Which would give a multiplier to all damage done by the player. Previously, the greatest way to grind combat was farming ghasts on the personal island, with ghast minions. But then, the Hypixel developers added a man called Maddox in this approximate location in the main hub. And Maddox had a quest. Kill zombies in the crypts, to awaken the revenant horror, which shall drop several fancy materials upon death. But nobody cares about that. These revenant horror quests gave absolutely broken amounts of combat experience. So all I had to do, was kill a few hundred of these things using bow spamming and sword spamming and clicky spamming. Along the way I got a few scythe blades. But these were not nearly as funny, as when I finally achieved combat 50. This left mining 50 and fishing 50. The two hardest skills to obtain. Uh, I guess I regret it giving up sleep to get it. Mm. I had to, like, give up hours of sleep each day just to grind for it. Requiring intense gaming setups and long periods of gaming. So I would need a bit of assistance, from my loyal minions. I obtained 24 tier 11 snow minions, which was the maximum amount of minions I could place on the private island for now. These would deposit and excavate their own snow, which would give hundreds of thousands of mining experience when collected every day. Because it was possible to steal mining experience from the working class, the rest of the 50 million experience needed for mining 50 would be outsourced to this cobble general by holding left click while running down this cobblestone generator for 100,000 experience points per hour, repeated for several hours, for several days, for a few weeks. This was difficult not due to a skill issue, but because this had the same mind-numbing effect as watching Coco Melon for 100 hours in a row, I eventually closed in on mining 50, which culminated in a special ceremony where I proceeded to descend into the deep caverns to unearth a piece of obsidian, resulting in my character obtaining two defense, and everyone in trouble brewing cheering. But did this mental drainage save me enough mental sanity to obtain fishing 50? There was only one way to find out. Fishing 50 would take a few hundred hours of staring at water, right clicking casting a rod, and paying attention so that I could have good enough timing to catch objects, a few tens of thousands of times. I could not fish and watch funny videos at the same time. I had to actually pay attention. So I decided to outsource as much fishing experience as humanly possible, by using 24 fishing minions, which would give a few hundred thousand experience a day from collecting whatever junk they had. As for manual fishing, I had to find a spot with at least one block of water, where nobody could bother me. The best place for that would be a place that was so utterly useless and distanced from everything else that nobody would ever go to it. Bingo. The barn had a water aqueduct branching over this expanse of farmland. Which I shall fish from. But you may have remembered that not all fishes are actually fish. Deadly sea monsters could still be fished up from the depths due to my overly high fishing level. Which is another reason why I chose the aqueduct. If you are familiar with physics. Fishing an object involves pulling it towards you. This may sometimes result in the object going behind you. While all of this is happening, gravity constantly accelerates the objects downwards, which may result in it being below you. This is what happens when you fish sea creatures at the barn. They will all fall below me, where they cannot bother me. So every six minute of normal fishing, I would drop down and kill all of the accumulated sea creatures, since they would also reward me with even more fishing experience. So after weeks of watching meaningless numbers go up, I was finally closing in on fishing 50. The final milestone for maxing all skills. This, was the final stretch.
What had started as a joke competition with Not Not Melon 8 months ago, had ended 1000 hours later, in a 140p Hindi subtitle no virus free download stream, where my biggest achievement in gaming had been achieved. I had used LV60's original fishing rod to reach the final level, as a tribute. But rather than fishing with the original Murdy Blurp squad, I was surrounded by trouble brewing members, and screamed viewers. Because while this whole skill average 50 journey was occurring, I decided to document it on I go by lots of names, which reached 30 kilo subscribers on the same day as when I maxed all skills. Which was a high enough sub count, for me to get YouTube rank on Hypixel. But getting these two things would be the last major goals I would ever obtain in Skyblock. I would never game as hard again. At that time, the Dungeons update and Mayor update was released along with several hundreds of hours worth of new content to consume. But I was not particularly interested in the new activities. So I spent a bit of time adding embellishments to my private island. Over the past year, the island had been completely transformed. At the center were a cluster of portals leading to various notable locations. There were several signs to commemorate significant events such as, this, in local frog memorial. And there were several NPCs such as Swag Lord, who had some opinions on something, and a Pablo NPC that only said the first few lines of ransom by Little Tekka. There was the farm portal, which obviously led to the farms. But there were more than just sugar cane and pumpkin plantations. There were layers for wheat, carrots, potatoes, and other stuff. These were intended to help me reach the newly released Farming 60, which I never reached due to boredom. The Cactus Farms, Nether Ward Ceiling Farm, Melon Minion Farms, Mushroom Farm, and other random farms had all been created wherever there was free space. The notable mention, was this abandoned Magma Cream Farm, back when Magma Cream Minions were the greatest source of passive income. Here was the original Enderman Killer which was now obscured by a few trees, and this giant waterfall that I had created just so I could record this silly enchanting 60 trick shot. <laughs> to the north, was this giant mansion thingy, which was intended to be an area for co-op council meetings. But nobody actually showed up. To the west was the main storage facility, which was never used because I put everything I needed in some random chests outside. To the left, was an unfinished personal house, with some potion facilities, a bedroom facility, and a secret vault that was supposedly under 24-7 surveillance. Inside, were the chests I used to store auction flipping materials, some weird stuff, and the leftover items stored by LV60. Somewhere east were the houses used to store minions, which had two basement floors for even more minions. This was next to the cobblestone generator used to obtain mining 50. At the far east were some random structures I built for YouTube background footage. Which was adjacent to the enchanting 50 area, the massive animal dropper of death, and some other contraptions of death I used for leveling combat. As for the other central portals. One of them led to Not Not Melon's grave, and another one was the super secret personal shortcut which led to another auction flipping thingy. But what else could I possibly do in Skyblock? The public institution of public education was hosted as online school, leaving far too much free time to spend. But that would slightly change, one fateful day. On October 29th, the biggest Hypixel Skyblock Discord server, known as Skyblock Simplified, had been bamboozled by a group of trollers that would come to be known as Guild H. 
And this raid, was made possible, by Not Not Melon, who was the original creator of Skyblock Simplified. As the result of tense tensions building up over a few months, Melon would give backdoor access to Skyblock Simplified's main bot, to some developers from High Auctions, the place to check Skyblock auctions. This was so that High Auctions could troll the new owner of Skyblock Simplified, who was Crafted Fury, who became the owner after Melon quit Skyblock. The result, was that High Auctions modified the bot, so that it would spam everyone with an error message for the rest of eternity. And all disaster and apocalypse and catastrophe broke loose. The server was hastily locked down after the raid, and a counter announcement was made. Crafted Fury had found the perpetrators of the trolling from High Auctions. But since he did not feel like exposing High Auctions in the announcement, he decided to refer to them, as Guild H. And so, Guild H was born. But first, a little bit more backstory. Back when Melon quit Skyblock in around February of 2020, I had been promoted to a Discord moderator for humorous reasons in Skyblock Simplified. So after 6 months of inactivity as a Discord moderator myself, I decided to return to take a look at the chaos occurring after the trolling. After doing a tiny bit of investigation, I decided to meet with Guild H to discuss what had just happened. I had already met the owner of High Auctions, the place to check auctions, after donating two summoning eyes to him. So I asked for some information about the raid. And made a documentary. It was at that point, that I had unknowingly joined Guild H. A friend group which would continue to play a small part in some things that I sometimes did, for the rest of eternity. This group included, Sully, Jonah, and other people, who would assist me with certain things in certain videos at certain times. And this raid coverage wouldn't be the last documentary I would create. With the few friend groups I had and the communities I were a part of, I had quite a few connections around the server that I could use to obtain interesting information to make a story out of. This was necessary for my next move on Hypixel. I was going to become the fit MC of Hypixel Skyblock. The video making process was to search up some keywords on Hypixel forums, scroll around to find stuff, scrape together some basic information, contact some potential sources of deeper information, consult some friends for even more information, put everything together in a script, download a bunch of stock photos, make a bunch of random replay mod clips and assemble it all together in the app known as Premiere Pro, to make a documentary. Then I rinse and repeat it, but with different topics I remembered throughout my time on Skyblock. Such as, the infamous 6th Third Bank scam. The infamous Jamiro Macroin incident. The infamous Hypixel Alpha server dupe. And many more. It was after the 6th documentary that I hit 100,000 subs, which was shortly followed by the creation of channel memberships. Which was how I met RiceBlades11. But he was not the only person I had seen. As part of the documentary making process, I met and interviewed quite a few new people around the community, including some former infamous Skyblock players, some programmers, a few YouTubers, the only other man who went all in on high pixel Skyblock documentaries, was the infamous Hellcastle and Tyler. So I would share some random stories with Hellcastle whenever I didn't feel like covering something myself. Which included the Chicken Crown of Greed 500 million coin disappearance incident, and the Sully Loves Melons incident. I had received news that Sully from Guild H had used a dupe method obtained from RiceBlades11, to spontaneously create billions of coins, just so that Sully could buy billions of coins worth of watermelons, draining the entire skyblock economy of melons. The footage of this was published under Guild H official leaks. But since I didn't feel like covering the 10 million stooping incident on my own channel, I decided to forward this story to Hellcastle, who would proceed, to make this. But of course, giving ideas to other YouTubers was not in vain. In return, Hell Castle told me how to find transparent images on Google that were not fake transparent. And I would get countless other ideas from my other friend groups. In Trouble Brewing, there was a man known as 2NFG. 
Just like everyone else, he had begun to know life sky block during quarantine. But what set him apart from everyone else, was the fact that he would somehow become one of the richest players on the server in just a few months, using a little trolling. Only to lose it all in a single day to a no SU player. So I decided to milk this into an epic documentary, summarizing the rise and downfall of 2NFG. However, the ending shown in that documentary was not actually the end of 2NFG. When the Hypixel Skyblock developers released the new Dante update, along with the ability to vote for human mayors to lead the community, I decided to repay 2NFG by running a mayor campaign for him, even though he was banned from Hypixel, and to milk that into yet another documentary for even more views. It was genius. Or was it? Because despite all of our efforts spamming the chat messages of every single server in the multiverse, bribing random players to vote for 2NFG, using exploits to ruin public lobbies, getting tens of people to rename themselves to pawns of the 2NFG movement, and hosting our own 2NFG Minecraft manhunt at MP for no reason in particular, we were beaten by Technoblade in the end. It was not even close. Even 30 virus was ahead of us. And so, the moral of the story, is that sometimes, absolutely nothing can be learned from something that was done. I had mostly stopped grinding in the game itself, because I had ascended to simply interacting with the game community instead. And funnily enough, my journey in Hypixel Skyblock would end where it started. My final major documentary on Hypixel, was about the Dante incident, which happened during a server-wide event intended for Technoblade to stream. And my journey in Skyblock had started, all because of Technoblade. He was the man who made things happen in Skyblock. But I, would cause my own downfall, with one single chat message. Why did I do this, you may ask? I forgot. But I now had to go through Hypixel support to explain myself and why I should be unbanned. So I sent an email to begin the process of freeing I go by lots of names. But in the meantime, I could look through my video idea list and determine which clickbait I should make next. Or, I could join a server hosted by Jonah from Guild H, which was called the DaBaby SMP, back when the baby was funny. And Jonah had also invited several other Guild H members, and some Skyblock players. So I decided to join as well just to check it out for a small quantity of time. Little did I know, about the two year rabbit hole that I would go through. As you can see, the Hypixel Skyblock community, including Guild H, intersected quite a lot with the modded Minecraft community. And I was rather surprised when I attempted to log into the DaBaby SMP and was met with a few hundred errors due to my client not having the needed mods to game with Guild H. Apparently I needed to download this mod pack named Infinity Evolved Reloaded, which had three different clickbait keywords in its name. And when I logged in, the different clickbait keywords, all kicked in. The developers basically threw together a few hundred different modifications featuring things such as real nuclear reactors not clickbait, Infinity Ingot 9x9 crafting table not clickbait, and Draconic Equipment Dragon Ultra Boss Fight Challenge not clickbait and the developers coded in recipes to obtain creative mode items not clickbait, which could grant infinite power, infinite items, and infinite fluids. Not clickbait. All of this looked like something copied from the average wisp challenge. And since this was my first time playing modded Minecraft, I was absolutely clueless. I decided to join the Guild Age team, since they seemed to know what they were doing. And the first thing they would do, was build a nuclear reactor for easy electricity in the beginning. I did not know how to build a nuclear reactor. So I followed every single instruction given to me by Guild H. Apparently, I had to go kill some mobs, take some items from some chests, put them in this weird machine that made weird noises, do some other oddly specific tasks, and all of a sudden, this would magically make some of the things we needed. It was at this moment when I realized that when I opened my inventory, I could use this search bar as a Google search engine to find items, and click on them to view all the possible methods that could be used to get that item I just clicked on. 
This was overpowered. And I would use this, to deal with the new instructions sent by Guild H. I was to equip myself with the pickaxe and go into this blue tinted portal leading into this super flat world with hostile mobs disabled somehow. Supposedly this was the Aroma 1997 mining dimension. Deep underground, were a bunch of ores of elements that did not seem too vanilla. Such as copper, tin, silver, and about 15 different elements. Including uranium, which I was sent here to collect. Upon returning, I was met with the site of the Guild Age nuclear reactor nearing completion. And my teammates demanded that I handed over the uranium. They then went into some secret room thing and emerged a few minutes later with some nuclear reactor parts. Amongst the weirdly textured blocks, they dumped some red liquid which drowned the inner machinations. And the reactor was sealed shut. Upon booting up the reactor, the main screen filled up with some weird numbers and symbols, such as RF slash T. And all the machines in the base powered up. It was at this moment that I was hooked on modded Minecraft. And I decided to learn more about how this whole thing worked, so I could possibly obtain the creative items. The main source of information was a fellow player named Ancient Old Man. He had a base a few hundred blocks away. And in just a few hours, it was already looking like society if it was real. I was in utter shock and amazement. So I proceeded to copy down his gaming strategies. Apparently, by injecting water into my nuclear reactor, I could obtain ridiculous amounts of steam which could be fed into a turbine to increase its rotational motion, which magically results in energy. What now? After taking a look at what everyone else was doing, I immediately realized what I must do next. I must obtain whatever this orange equipment is. The Draconic equipment. This, would turn me into God itself. So this would come at a very hefty price, including nether stars, and other mob loot. The vanilla methods I had known would not suffice for getting everything. And ancient old man was not online all the time. So rather than asking him for help, I decided to draw information from other places on the internet. Such as Feed the Beast Reddit, Feed the Beast Wikipedia, and a bit of Dire Wolf 20 tutorials. Anything else that I couldn't figure out would be done with private test worlds, brute force, or trial and error. After gathering enough information and going down sufficient modded rabbit holes to come up with the designs I needed to obtain riches, I played for tens of hours straight on the server to bring my plans into reality. Insane mob farms. Custom dimensions of diamond blocks. The slaughter of the hardest boss. And the obtaining of the orange equipment. The result, is that I broke the Guild Age server with a cursed earth mob farm that accidentally spawned thousands of uncontained entities with speed and strength buffs. Looking back, now that I knew more about what I was doing, I do not actually wish to change anything. Because playing modded while being clueless was an experience close to magical. By that time, I had been unbanned from Hypixel. But I had lost interest in Hypixel Skyblock after seeing the endless possibilities of modded Minecraft in the Guild Age to Baby SMP. So I would gradually quit Skyblock. This had the side effect, of me donating all my valuables to various causes on Skyblock. I had already talked about this in a previous important announcement. So I am going to simply download my own video and copy over the important parts into this one. In August of 2021, after involving myself with infamous skilled Necron, I witnessed the downfall of two of the richest players in the game, which was complained about before the admins shut down the discussion. But the aftermath was something only a few know. These two players, along with some of their friends, decided to share a new Minecraft account and fuse their old names together into Food Youth. Its goal, was to speed run Skyblock with several people from different continents logging on during different time zones to grind 24-7. And this was financially supported with my leftover coins. Unfortunately the project was shut down due to being banned once again. Around the same time an entire Minecraft album was released by the Necron Guild, commemorating all of the cheating and macroing. Necron's legit and if you say they ain't you capping, they'll f*** it, your PC so long, 
and there were a few cameos bought from a man called Fat Man to discuss the socioeconomic issues of high pixel skyblock. That's the point of grind. You're just trying to work yourself to death. For what? What is causing you to work yourself this hard or game this damn hard? What do you think you're going to get out of it? Let me tell you realistically what you will get out of it. You're going to go to the hospital a lot faster. Okay? Your eyes are going to deteriorate. Your brain's going to deteriorate. Your f***ing arm muscles and your neck muscles and your neck structure and your back structure is going to deteriorate. Your social skills are going to go downhill. You're going to become a f***ing actual live hermit crab. This was supposed to be covered in a documentary but I was distracted by another funny idea. The 2NFG channel. It originally started around February of 2021, around the same time that shorts and other low-quality videos began flooding the entire YouTube website, which included high-pixel skyblock content. And we had an idea. What if we made a new channel except everything we made was a parody of these short spamming individuals? I became 2NFG's editor and began making the unfunniest videos possible. Making something so unfunny that it fell in between being so bad that it was good, and being actually good. This is Ground Zero. This continued until July when I created an extremely sad movie where 2NFG gets donated 50 kilotons of TNT and canonically becomes not alive. And then it was resumed in December when I was hired to edit once again, which was basically just putting red circles over everything. And then he probably quit. At around the same time my financial support was sought once again, by the individual known as Single. The backstory is that Single had lost 300 million coins due to buying a god potion from the auction house on accident. So to commemorate this loss he decided to create a god potion museum, which was a giant god potion monument with even more god potions inside on display. I donated around 50 of my potions to attempt to fill the museum, but it would soon prove to be impossible to finish the project because it required far too many potions to complete. So there was yet another attempt at making a museum. This time, the theme was the history of United States presidents. We would set up 52 item frames containing items that were renamed to every president. This would be done with the server's cake soul system. A cake soul is an object that changes its name to the name of any player you left click on. And if you combine this with the nickname feature that came with YouTube rank, which let me rename myself to nearly anything, this was overpowered. So I spent hundreds of millions of coins purchasing cake souls and setting my nickname to every president up until Joe Biden. And Single would use me to rename all 52 cake souls for each president, which was put on YouTube for the public to witness. This pinnacle of achievement was also posted on Reddit, but was deleted for being too political. Notable mention. When the project was halfway done, the auction house ran out of cake souls so we bought some more from the prosperous individual known as Ben Clark, who was also involved in Hell Castle's museum until the admins changed the cake soul feature and made cake souls 50 times less funnier. Anyways once that was over, me and Single would soon be involved in the funniest guild in Hypixit, aka Fishy Cult. It was here that I donated hair-brained quantities of my leftover coins to random people such as YM Cat Lord, to fund his pursuit of he who shall not be named on my channel. And I also found Jonathan Arbuckle here. Which is basically the guy that the create above and beyond skeleton is named after. And then came the mega co-op hosted by Dayo Time. Which probably has around 10 hours worth of absolutely captivating Minecraft history. This includes the Great Heart of the Mountain 3 race, which could be covered in a 5-part documentary series. But the main idea is that Single raced infamous player 15 hours to see who could get Heart of the Mountain 3 first. And Single won after I distracted 15 hours for 2 minutes. At around the same time I placed down signs with the entire IP address copy pasta from the Caterpillar Guy video, but ironically I wouldn't be banned for personal information jokes until June. 
Shortly after that I joined the guild known as Kansas which was basically a retirement home for players who got bored of the game. At this point I basically had no valuable objects left. And basically everyone I knew from 2020 and 2021 had quit by now. So I could rest in peace, until my final trolling on June. This aforementioned final trolling on June, was when on June of 2022, I was told by RiceBlades11 about something funny happening in Hypixel. I then logged in for the first time in months and said a bunch of randomly generated stuff, including the top 10 facts about Mouse Odious, including some fake coordinates, which were fake because coordinates could not have east or west at the same time. But the Hypixel staff did not find this particularly humorous. And I was permanently banned again. Anyways, back to June of 2021. After basically quitting Hypixel Skyblock, it was time to return to modded Minecraft gaming. You may recall that the man known as Ancient Old Man was one of the main sources of information on Infinity Evolved Reloaded. Well, he had another piece of information to articulate to me. He whispered into my ear that I should attempt the mod pack known as Enigmatic at 2 Expert Mode. The most recommended expert pack, serving as a good introduction to most of the major technology and magic mods, which were the two categories of mods. And by expert, it means that beating the game will actually require brain power and strategy, instead of exploiting three overpowered modifications to steamroll everything. So I decided to accept this challenge. The result, is that after about a hundred hours of factory building, I had survived all the way to the end. By end, I mean I had to assemble all of these clickbait looking objects together, to form the creative ending upgrade, which basically grants creative mode and survival mode. Not much will be covered here since I have already made a video on this playthrough. But I had learned more about mods from this experience. The main notable mentions include the following. Advanced rocketry, with completely customizable rockets and planets. RF tools which allow the creation of my own resource-laden dimensions for personal exploitation. Nuclear craft, with fusion reactor donuts and nuclear reactions. Applied energistics too, which allowed the automation of everything mentioned previously, using gaming computers. Blood magic, which was self-explanatorily very bloody. Tomcraft, which I did not learn. Botania, which I did not learn. And finally, Draconic Evolution and Avarisha, for becoming God itself. This, along with a bunch of miscellaneous technological additions such as mechanism and industrial craft and thermal expansion, gave me a few hundred items to create, each with their own way of creating. The joy of making something astoundingly expensive was rather joyful. Thus, Enigmatic at 2 Expert Mode became the first mod pack I had slayed. But this, would only be a taste of the insanity I would partake in, later on. By that time, it was nearly September. And physical, real, effort requiring school was reopening in just a few weeks. Which would waste several million more seconds. I had ceased to make high pixel documentaries due to a lack of good ideas. So I had moved on, to other random topics that I wanted to talk about such as if a monkey could beat Minecraft. But I wanted to score something big on YouTube, before school started once again. I had to get one final YouTube victory for myself. So I decided to scroll through my collection of video ideas, to see if there was anything intriguing to be milked, and I stumbled upon this document called the Void Document, where I had attempted to calculate the longest possible time you could survive in the Void in creative mode. I had aborted this mission because I found that someone already did it before me. But then, an idea voyaged from the five-dimensional ideatic plane into my brain cells. I could put a twist on this original idea, to turn this into a challenge, where I must collect thousands of enchanted golden apples and tens of elytras to survive about 10 hours in the void, all in survival mode, with no mods or cheats. This was a massive undertaking. So I would have to race to complete it before the deadline of September 1st, when school began. Despite getting distracted for one day to watch Ruben Sim, I had completed the challenge and edited everything for the Void Challenge. All that was left to do was to publish the evidence that I had done something worth watching.
this had serious implications for the future of gaming. However, no other challenge I would come up with will ever come close to the insanity of the void challenge. And real life normal school had begun. But I was now going to go all in on insane Minecraft challenges not clickbait. This time, rather than doing a purely vanilla challenge this time, I decided to investigate a suggestion that I had planned to investigate a while ago. Compact Claustrophobia, a mod pack where the player awakens in a 3x3x3 world, and must use resourcefulness to escape. And this escalates rapidly, into fusion reactors and nuclear reactors for some reason. But do not fear. For I had enough modded Minecraft experience to build a functioning nuclear craft fusion reactor without causing the reactor meltdown. And to balance out my relative success, I achieved a few disastrous mistakes that destroyed a few tens of hours. But I persevered. My main motivation for the first 5% of a playthrough was that I had nothing else to do with gaming. The final 95% was mainly motivated by the sunk cost fallacy. The logic was that I had already gone this far. So I might as well go all the way. With this rather tenuous determination, the compact claustrophobia escape room would eventually be escaped. With half the playtime being spent staring at endgame recipes, and the other half being spent brute forcing the progression with sheer brute force. The results were covered in a two-part series. And then I proceeded to learn some random new facts from investigating the comments section. This, combined with a bit more research and testing, would give me more knowledge, for whatever I would do next. After compact claustrophobia, I investigated another suggestion suggested by ancient old men. Known as Divine Journey 2. The biggest mod pack I had seen so far, requiring only about 900 hours to complete, spanning exploration, technology, magic, more exploration, and killing bad guys. It was indeed an expert mod pack. But those words no longer scared me. I had accumulated just enough modded Minecraft experience to barely get past the beginning of the mod pack, using the knowledge I had gained from previous gaming experiences. The first section of Divine Journey 2, popularly known as the Exploration Dimension Hopping section, would be beaten after 30 hours, and summarized as killing 20 major bosses across 7 dimensions in 100 days, insane challenge not clickbait. However, 30 divided by 900 is a small number. Therefore, my playthrough of Divine Journey 2 is extremely uncompleted. The upcoming chapters of Divine Journey 2 would be based on technology and industry, which I had gotten principally proficient at. But unfortunately, after the technology chapters, were the magic chapters, and I knew slightly less than nothing about how to do something with the main magic mods, since I had avoided magic and mod packs whenever it was humanly or inhumanly possible. Because magic was for the uncivilized. Plus it was boring. But perhaps I shall revisit Divine Journey in a few decades. In the meantime, I tended to swing between vanilla and modded challenges. In the following months, I had jumped 59,000 blocks into the atmosphere survived a month in upside down gaming, and yet another month without oxygen. I then beat one of the most famous mod packs, which is known as Stone Block 2, where one begins in an empty cave and must create an entire self-sustaining underground civilization. Spoiler alert! Escape was futile and impossible, but at least I had basically unlocked creative mode. And finally, I created a house out of solid bedrock in Minecraft Bedrock Edition. All of these adventures are covered in greater detail in their own unhinged gaming documentary playthroughs. In between these challenges were a few one-off explorations, such as whether or not Minecraft Education Edition was actually educational. The answer is <laughs> The only scrapped project from this era of gaming was my completed Cuboid Outpost playthrough. This was yet another ancient old man recommendation. Since he had a streak of having good suggestions, I decided to immerse myself in the cuboid outpost. Apparently, I was stranded in the average New York residency, in an infinitely large stretch of barren snowy wasteland. The goal, was to escape to the overworld. There were about 5 billion problems, which were basically one problem, 
some Earth scientists had gone too far, resulting in some quantum fusion reactor space NASA Elon Musk cryptocurrency space laser nuclear superweapon quantum catastrophe. So I would have to rebuild civilization on this outpost so that I could return to civilization, not to be confused with the civilization I just made. After beating this so-called cuboid outpost, I scrapped the project, because I did not feel like covering it. But if enough people request the coverage of the escape of cuboid outpost, then I shall change my mind in a few decades. If you are hearing this, it is already too late. This may be the last message you will receive from us. You see, our science division here at the Cuboid Corp trademark have made a little bit of a mistake. Somehow they managed to quantum entangle not two, but three singularities at once. At first we thought this was amazing scientific progress, but that was when, it, happened. An uncontrollable chain reaction began, with one of the side effects being a giant explosion that will kill us all and destroy our planet. So we have a few minutes to tell you exactly what to do. You are currently stationed on Outpost 42 on the other side of the galaxy so you should be fine for now. Your outpost currently contains only a few basic machines and resources, and you will only survive for so long on your barren dead wasteland. Not to mention, we believe that the quantum entanglement has messed up the laws of the universe, with one of the effects being that these weird green and white things will spawn on your planet, which our science division are calling mobs. It will take a lot of effort, good planning, and intelligence to break yourself out of this planet. So for now, follow the instructions and use the resources we have sent you, to hopefully find a new home to live in. Good luck, I go by lots of names. But what if, these single player challenges could be expanded to multiplayer? This would most likely end in chaos and destruction. But chaos and destruction were funny. So the first multiplayer video idea I had, was a generic prison escape challenge, just to test my server. This would basically be speedrunner versus 4 hunters not clickbait insane challenge except on a prison island. And I lost 50 times in a row. When I eventually won, I realized that my victory was boring, because I did not script the video. Even then, a video where I simply have to escape a small island would be boring, no matter how I did it. So I decided to change the goal a bit. Rather than having my friends try to prevent me from escaping federal prison, I decided to invite several friends from Hypixel Skyblock, to have them race to get all achievements first. This included, The Realm 7, Bill Clinton 420, Rice Blades 11, Dojaw from Carrot Farm, Dayo Time from Time Dayo, Boomer W from Infamous Necron Cheater Guild, and Howdy from a server owned by Guild H. Out of this assortment of random high pixel players, and a goal that was impossible to achieve, I was expecting an epic tryhard event with an epic plot, genius strategies, deep stories, emotional plot twists, nail-biting drama, and real-life consequences. What actually happened, was the average Indian drama. Out of the 20 people who accepted, only 2 people hoped to be the winner. The other 18 were friends of the two tryhards, which led to the creation of two teams. Guild H, and Cardi Gang. Which unsurprisingly formed a rivalry. These two teams would boost their leaders, aka Effa from Guild H, and Howdy from Cardi Gang, to get all achievements first. But since everyone was a high pixel sky block player, there were no good combaters. Except Puffy from Cardi Gang, who trolled the Realm 7 and Effa from Guild H, in a rather entertaining fight. And then everything went downhill. Days 1 and 2 were just the average generic 100 player events, with some fighting, some explosions, and some progress being made. But this was preceded, by various questionable moves. A player known as Dojo would accidentally set off a chain reaction leading to the downfall of the Carti team, simply by saying that he found good loot in the ancient cities. This led to the Carti team getting greedy resulting in them attempting a raid on the infamous ancient city. They did not return, due to this guy. And the Carty base was raided while the squad was stuck in an infinite jump scare loop. Meanwhile, the downfall of Guild Age was caused by the release of the Minions Rise of Gru movie. 
Effa had gone outside for three hours so he could view the Minions film. And a third team, known as Quaglet and Deo Time and Strafe, would take advantage of this to infamously grieve Guild H. But then, the unthinkable happened. The nightmare became a reality, when Bill Clinton 420 logged onto the Guild H base, and finished this Guild H headquarters water elevator skyscraper. Which was used, to AFK farm MLGs. And like all other Minecraft social experiments, tensions between literally everyone on this server would inexplicably and unreasonably increase to a boiling point where every single team wanted to fight each other in a final showdown that would decide everything for the final time. The Carty team, Guild Age team, and Deo Time team all geared up with netherite, explosives, and other stuff. And they had this epic final battle in a valley. What happened? Yeah. Yeah, now it's a, now it's a fair fight. I see them. Oh, you wanna pull? Okay. Fight them in the water. Oh, are you fighting him? Uh, oh. Probably a horrible gear. They are. They're pretty good. I'm just gonna go out. Well, are you? Are you like one v two right now? I'm one v two right now. V2 right now. Oh, bruh. It's a 1v2 on me. You can crystal him if he jumps up. Pull out your crystals. Easy. And thus, the I go by lots of names SMP concluded. And then a solo player known as Boomer W actually got all achievements and won the challenge. So shout out to Boomer W. Anyways, while I was editing the achievements race documentary, something would happen that would lead to it being cancelled. At 2 AM, a glorious idea would pop into my head. Overriding all other priorities. This idea, became my sole purpose temporarily. I would proceed to then labor endlessly and laboriously for the next few weeks to bring this idea to fruition. This idea, would come to be known, as the Greg Tech movie. I wanted to make a social experiment, with no admin intervention, no rules, and 100 players. This was the opportune time to host an event since it was the summer break of 2022, and I could simply obtain 100 players by pulling people from community posts. And this experiment would test people's skills in running a civilization. But of course, civilizations would need their own social structures, technological innovations, and ideologies, in order for a truly interesting civilization experiment. Not just any civilization, but a space civilization. 
If only there was a Minecraft mod pack that had its own detailed technological progression, weapons, and space exploration. And there was. In the form of Greg Tech mod packs, which I will explain later. However, forcing everyone to play Greg Tech New Horizons would be unethical, and would cause the experiment to last 37 years. So I would force everyone to play this comparatively easier Greg Tech mod pack that I randomly found on Curse Forge. It was called Nomi Factory Greg Tech Community Edition Unofficial Edition. Which has a long story. But we will skip that. Since I had gained some experience hosting events from the achievements race, and since a rather generous person known as Gold Rusher One allowed me to borrow his god tier server to host the space civilization experiment, everything went rather non-catastrophically. And the story, ended up being far better than I had expected, according to me and several hundred thousand verified independent fact checkers. Besides that, nothing else will be revealed here because everything that happened has already been talked about 9 months ago. So watch that instead. And speaking of hosting. Click the link in the description to be redirected to the website known as bisecthosting.com, to get deals on cheap, powerful, and customizable server hosting. All you have to do is click this, click a few more buttons, and use this code on the screen to get a discount. And you will have your server. Now you can play Minecraft Manhunt and Insane Dream SMP Challenge Try Not To Laugh Challenge with your friends on your own server. Please buy servers. I only have 3 days. They, are coming. Back to what I was talking about. After the success of the Greg Tech simulation, the different teams ended on good terms in the Discord server. And most players got over the war crimes done on my server. However, there was one player, who was a more notabler mention than all the other notable mentions. Reagan. When he joined the event, he had brought along a rather large cabal of friends with him to form what would become one of the main teams on my server. The People's Grijek Society. Abbreviated as the PGS. And I had joined the PGS to receive behind the scenes information that I needed to put in my coverage of the event. But even though this Grijek society had been formed for the purpose of teamwork during the event, this friend group would continue to exist long after the event. Long enough for me, for them to feed me enough information to continue my descent down the rabbit hole of modded Minecraft. From what we have seen so far, mod packs could be anything. Some mod pack creators have shown their insane creativity and dedication in some creations. There were hundreds to choose from in the infamous website known as Curse Forge. But the ones that stood out the most to me, were the infamous Greg Tech mod packs, which I had heard of from a few sources here and there. And as promised 5 minutes ago, I will explain Greg Tech. It was an invention that was invented by an individual known as Gregorius T. It had started out as a simple add-on for another technological Minecraft called Industrial Craft. And then it ballooned out of proportions and evolved into madness. After a very long story, one of the most actively developed Greg Tech versions as of today, was Greg Tech Community Edition Unofficial, on Minecraft 1.12, which is one of the most used versions for Minecraft mods for some reason. This Community Edition unofficial version, was not developed by the original Gregorius T but it had the words Community Edition in it for a reason. It was open for people to contribute gameplay ideas, programming skills, or bug reports, as long as they actually played the mod, and as long as sufficient brain power was evident. So on top of the several years of development made by previous developers, combined with several months of community collaboration, this Greg Tech project has grown into something that has true potential. A progression that was split into multiple tiers. Realistic electrical systems, disastrous electrical disasters, full chemistry synthesis, pragmatic ore excavation, lifelike oil processing, electronics manufacturing, nuclear dispensation, biological fabrication, and realistic everything, were all integral to the Greg Tech torture chamber. It had everything that anyone could ever wish for. But only the smartest and toughest shall be rewarded, with the glorious sight of their own self-sufficient industrial micro-civilizations in Minecraft. And due to this, Greg Tech would become infamous for its unrivaled difficulty and complexity. And it was only going to get more complicated from there. 
The Greg Tech community is currently rather small, but it is very dedicated, and exhibits rather cult-like behavior at certain times. In its current state, Greg Tech Community Edition Unofficial has eight different tiers of progression, with Fusion being unlocked at around the sixth tier. This could be further expanded, with add-ons being developed by the same community, such as Gregicality Multiblocks, Gregicality Science, and a notable mention, called Greg Tech Food Option. In a theoretical world where they were actually completed, they were capable of adding a several more tiers of progression. And from today, Greg Tech is projected to consume all other aspects of gaming and modding. There are apparently plans to add nuclear stuff, particle physics stuff, several other fields of technology, and even more incomprehensible stuff, dreamt up by the utterly deranged. This process of absorbing other modifications by doing what they could do, but even better, would be called gregification by some people. Which was a very vague term that could mean anything. Some of this had already been done in an earlier Greg Tech creation, known as Gregicality Legacy. An abomination which has long since been abandoned, mostly due to various reasons. At that time, the mod contained objects that had names like Quark Gluon Plasma, Quantum Chromodynamically Confined Matter, Topological Manipulators, Relativistic Spinorial Memory, Rydberg Spinorial Assembly, Hexanitrohexozizovurtsitane, Ferrocenile Fullerapyrodolidine, Andrenium Hosium Thallium Isophthal Oil Bistiethyl Thiourea Hexafluorophosphate. Of course, the player was expected to unironically obtain all of these. And this was true, in the mod pack known as Technological Journey, which I would call the infamous if more people knew about it. As the name implies, it was a journey throughout technology. And it is currently being journeyed through by some person known as Ghostipedia. But this wasn't the only other insane person who was juggling playing Greg Tech and documenting the playing of Greg Tech. There was also the infamous Threefold, who had slain Divine Journey 2, Nomi Factory, some other notable mentions, and 20% of the most infamous Greg Tech mod pack, called Greg Tech New Horizons, abbreviated as GTNH. This has all been caught in 4K by hundreds of videos. But to the surprise of approximately 60% of everyone in the multiverse, Threefold would proceed to start all over again in GTNH, and everyone's live reaction, was the dreaded realization that Greg Tech was inescapable and inevitable. But what made GTNH so infamous? The main reason, was that it used to take 4000 hours to beat. Now, nobody has any idea how long it will take. The craft is now so large that AE cannot calculate. So who knows if that thing is even possible now in 2.3? Because after 7 years of development, which is still ongoing today, the developers had incrementally made it more demanding to obtain the final item in the game, known as the Stargate. And as of the latest update of 2.3, GTNH was now even more unbelievable. There was no way that this is in Minecraft. Massive recipe walls, massive text walls, massive output walls. All of which had gotten bigger and better than what was foretold by the prophecies. This also featured the Gallifreyan Tirai of Harmony. The Dimensionally Transcendent Plasma Forge. Condensed Raw Stellar Plasma Mixture. Tachyon Rich Temporal Fluid. And servings of hot curried sausages. The broadening Nagian amounts of content related to Greg Tech were simply astounding. And I was one of the lucky few who were able to stumble upon Greg Tech and truly explore it. And so, the sheer amount of things to do in Greg Tech, combined with its future potential, caused me to abandon all other feeble technology mods, and to spend a bit more time playing around with Greg Tech for now. And this leads, to the final section of this videographic content. The present day. Towards the end of 2022 summer break, after witnessing Greg Tech, I decided that I would take yet another shot at making my own mod pack. And Hypixel Skyblock 7 was born, my sixth attempt at making a functioning, working mod pack. The previous six attempts are not notable mentions, so they will not be noted or mentioned. In this Hypixel Skyblock 7, I added Greg Tech. Far Plane 2, Realistic Weather Mod, Realistic World Generator, and the Ambience Mod, to create this experience. The idea, 
was to present the player with an infinitely large, rich, and mysterious world all for the taking. The goal was to become a tier 3 Kardash of civilization in Minecraft, using various means that I had not even come up with yet. This would be a groundbreaking, revolutionary, insert another keyword, mod pack never done before. But while I was in the PGS, I stumbled upon some alarming information. One of the PGS members, Zalgo, had a mod pack of his own. And the idea was to present the player with a ruined, hostile, dangerous world all for the taking. The goal was to become a tier 3 card to chef civilization in Minecraft, using various means that the developer team had not even come up with yet. This would be a groundbreaking, revolutionary, insert another keyword, mod pack never done before. So I had an idea. Rather than dealing with developing my own mod pack on my own, I could combine efforts and ideas with Zalgo and his development team to make something even more epic. And this deal was accepted. By the way, the name of Zalgo's project shall not be revealed yet. But it is real. And it will have lore, exploration, technology, 16 tiers of Greg Tech, universal colonization, oil, and guns. In the meantime, with the multiplayer experiments out of the way, I could return to a more regular schedule of posting. But the majority of videos had been replaced with modded Minecraft. The transformation was complete. I had gone down the pipeline. And now, after doing a bit of messing around on some random assorted mod packs, I would do what the other 100,000 people were doing. I was going to stick to Nomi Factory. And beat it myself. I would go through realistic electrical systems, disastrous electrical disasters, full chemistry synthesis, pragmatic ore excavation, lifelike oil processing, electronics manufacturing, nuclear dispensation, biological fabrication, and realistic everything. And I would document all of it. I am approximately 25% of the way there, but I shall one day obtain the creative ending upgrade. And there was only one way to find out if I will obtain it. Like and subscribe notification bell comment the video share and subscribe. So that is basically where I am at currently. This has been a collection of stories and notable mentions over the past 10 years. Looking back, we can see the evolution of technology, the rise and fall of industries, and the triumphs and struggles of people all around the world. From groundbreaking scientific discoveries to heartwarming acts of kindness, these stories have inspired us, moved us, and brought us together. As we continue to navigate the complexities of our modern world, may we always remember the lessons of our past and look forward with hope for a brighter future. In conclusion, that concludes my summarization of most of the things that have happened in my Minecraft journey over the past 10 years. And with that, I shall end the video.